Hi, everybody. It's great to have you all with us tonight. I'm Janice Kaminer-Resnick, and together with the leadership of Jews United for Democracy and Justice, Liz Zevierosofsky, Mel Levine, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and David Lehrer, I am so happy to welcome you to tonight's program featuring, featuring two exceptional guests, the illustrious George F. Will and LA's legendary journalist and host, Larry Mantle. These Wednesday night programs are a joint undertaking of Community Advocates, Inc. and Judge, two organizations committed to preserving our democracy. We especially welcome all the first timers in our audience. It's great to have you join us. To be clear, we are a small group of volunteers putting on these programs, sending out the emails and responding to all of your questions. We welcome all of your feedback, but don't be angry with us if a link doesn't work or if you get too many emails. With a once a week series like this, our email volume is by necessity higher than it was before this series began. So thanks for your patience and your understanding that we're all doing the best we can, and this is a labor of love. In our emails, we work hard to provide you with the most interesting columns and articles from a variety of publications on what we consider to be the most current crises that week. And we always have many to choose from. We love the wonderful affirming notes and emails we receive from our listeners, and we love the checks, large and small, which help us to continue our work, so thank you. Before we get to our program, thank you to our co-sponsors, Leo Beck Temple, Valley Beth Shalom, Stephen Wise Temple, Ikar, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Jewish Center for Justice and The Forward, and thank you to all of our donors. This week, once again, COVID records were broken. In fact, for 11 days in a row, we have set new records and the death toll is now on the rise. There seems to be no end in sight to the tailspin we are in. We are sad for those who are ill and we wish you a full recovery. And we mourn together with those who have lost loved ones due to, due to this pandemic. And to the rest of us, stay home, Stay socially distanced, mask safe, and healthy. We thank our first responders as we do each week, and we especially honor Dr. Fauci and the scientists who are working hard for their messages to be heard over some pretty distracting and frankly pretty outrageous noise designed to discredit science in favor of political interests. I will send you the newest Lincoln Projects ad on this topic right after the program tonight. Next week, we hope you will join us to welcome Bill Kristol and Pat Morrison on the subject of Can the Soul of Our Country Be Restored? Then Tom Friedman, James Carville, both with Warren Olney, and Congresswoman Bass with Lori Levinson, and then Nick Kristoff with Madeline Brand. And in a moment, David Lehrer, my partner, will announce an exciting new addition to the series. You can register for all of these programs in the email you will get right after the program tonight, and you can help fund them by sending me an email on and I will tell you how to contribute. Thank you for being such a great loyal audience. This mm -hmm. is a labor of love for all of us leading this effort and we really appreciate you joining us. And now to introduce our speakers, my friend, colleague and partner in this venture, David Lehrer. Thank you, Janice. On behalf of Community Advocates, I'm pleased to join and welcome you all here tonight to our virtual town hall. Our Wednesday evening encounters keep expanding in popularity Tonight, we have over 2,500 registrants from coast to coast and overseas as well. People are concerned and interested in learning and exploring. For our regulars, you know that our roster of speakers and moderators has been extraordinary. That run of success will continue in coming weeks with the addition on September 2nd of one of the most highly regarded legal journalists in the country, the New Yorkers and CNN's Jeffrey Tubin. He's the author of countless books and in three weeks, a new one will be released True Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump. It is Tubin's account of the epic legal and political battle to call Trump to account for his misdeeds. We'll hear all about it with Tubin and our friend, UC Irvine law professor Henry Weinstein, formerly the legal analyst of the LA Times. Tonight, as Janice mentioned, we have the incomparable George Will and Los Angeles' own natural resource, Larry Mantle. Will is a Pulitzer Prize prize-winning commentator, author, TV personality, and all-purpose pundit. He's the author of some 13 books on topics ranging from politics and statecraft to the craft of baseball. He's written a twice-weekly column on the, in the Washington Post since 1974. I calculated that amount, amounts to some 4,600 columns, an amazing body of work. In addition, he's an on-air contributor to NBC News and MSNBC. He's unique in the punditry universe and having been a character in episodes of Seinfeld, The Simpsons, and Saturday Night Live. Undoubtedly, his, except for tonight, omnipresent bow tie gives him away. Mr. Will will be joined by my good friend, Larry Mantle, the host of KPC's Air Talk, 
for over 35 years. Larry has interviewed thousands of guests on an extraordinary array of topics and has received many awards in the process, including a Golden Mic and the LA Press Club's Best Talk Show, among many others. Mr. Will and Larry share interests in varied topics way beyond the worlds of politics and public affairs, including a passion for baseball. Will authored an acclaimed book on the subject, and Larry's listeners know that for every year he disappears from the air for a week to attend spring training. And this year he even made it in before COVID hit the, the, the whole, our national pastime. This must be a sad year for them both on that front alone. This will be a wonderful conversation. Larry? Thank you so much, David. It is absolutely a pleasure to be a part of this, this series that Community Advocates and Judge has been putting on. And it's so impressive that in just uh, a few weeks during the time where we can't get together and do events in person, that so many people in the greater Los Angeles community have come together to talk about these issues that are so important to all of us. So it's a real honor for me to be invited to be a part of this series and to be with you uh, this afternoon to talk about the important issues that, that we're going to hear George Will discuss. Like many of you, I've been a reader of George Will's work and enjoying his commentary on politics on television for many years. In fact, uh, I started reading George Will's uh, column in Newsweek when I was 17 and just started college and growing up in Hollywood, a very liberal bubble uh, in Hollywood, reading George Will's conservative view of politics and the nation was extremely important for me in my development um, and love of, of politics, of public policy, and of American history. So George, it's a pleasure to get to talk with you this evening. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us uh, tonight. And um, why don't you take a couple minutes, if you would, to sort of lay out for us um, your thoughts about where, where we stand right now as a nation. Well, thank you. I'll be glad to do that. It, uh, if we were all 2,500 of us in a, in a ballroom, I would ask for a show of hands in answer to this question. How many of you participating in this event tonight own or know some who own, someone who owns a Ford F-150 series pickup truck. I suspect that around the world, where all the people are participating, there are very few hands going up. That is interesting because for 40 years now, the Ford F-150 truck has been the best-selling vehicle, not the best-selling truck, the best-selling vehicle in the United States. And I, strongly suspect that 90% of those who own them vote one way and 90% of those who don't vote another way. It's just one small indication of the polarity in our politics today. We're obsessed and understandably so with the turmoil in American life today, but there's one sense, and I think it's important to notice this, in which we're in a period of unusual stability in presidential politics. Our third, fourth, and fifth presidents, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, each won two consecutive terms. The next time we had three consecutive two-term presidents was Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. No one, no episode in American history has had four consecutive two-term presidents. We would have this unprecedented outcome if, in fact, Donald Trump wins in 2020. I'm quite confident he won't, but that gives you some sense of, of the of peculiar stability of our moment. In the politics today, both parties have to ask the question, are, they, are the American people angry? And if you watch cable television, I'm not recommending that, but if you do, you would get the sense that the American people are a cauldron of boiling fury. I don't think that's right. There are 328 million people in this country. And at any given moment, more than 320 million of the 320 million are not watching cable television and not listening to talk radio and are not boiling over with political passion. I think the American people are sad and they're sad because they're embarrassed and they're embarrassed because they're exhausted. Today's politics is more exhausting than I can ever anticipate 
uh, it having been in American history. I think the danger for the Republican Party and the subtext of our conversation tonight is the future of the Republican Party is this. An enormous number of young people are going to vote this year for the first time. And abundant sociological data demonstrates that the way you vote the first time is apt to skew you to vote in the future. I'll tell you a story. In 1964, when I cast my first vote for president, I think I was 23, and I was an ardent young Goldwater supporter, I was talking in Denora, Pennsylvania, where my grandfather lived, with a steel worker across the street from his house in this steel town in the Monongahela River Valley. And I said, why won't you vote for my man Goldwater? And he said, I don't like Hoover. Not I didn't like Hoover, I don't like Hoover. 1964, Hoover left office in 1932. The anti-Hoover impulse lingered and it plagued the Republican Party for generations. And it's very apt to be the case that the lingering echo of Donald Trump is going to do that. Donald Trump lost the popular vote in 2016. If he lost, if he wins in 2020, he will only do so losing the popular vote. It's inconceivable that he win the popular vote. That would mean that in three of the last six elections had been won by someone who lost the popular vote, which would be a, a terrible outcome. As I've said, I don't think that will happen, but it's a, again, it's an interesting data. I hope that has set the stage and we can now uh, converse about this very peculiar and altogether upsetting moment in our politics. I uh, absolutely. Uh, George, if you could get a little closer to your microphone just so we can hear you a little bit more clearly, that would be very good. Great, thank you. Uh, well, let's talk. Yeah, that is better. Thank you very much. Let's let's talk about the state of the Republican Party today. In your book, uh, the Conservative Sensibility, which came out last year, you write about classic liberalism, and and how you see that is as akin to American conservatism. Uh, distinct from European conservatism, but very much an American brand of conservatism. Are there any vestiges of that left in the Republican Party, or is this really Trump's party now? It is Trump's party now, and there are very few who are willing at least to speak and profess the view. You're quite right. The theme of my book is that European conservatism arose in reaction to change, in reaction to challenges to established church and established hierarchies. European conservatism was the defense of blood and soil, thrown an altar, establishment conservatism. American conservatism is exactly the reverse. American conservatism relishes turmoil, change, social fluidity, the creative destruction of a dynamic market society. Now, who represents this nowadays? Me, maybe you, and I'm not sure how many more. Uh, it's it's a very much a minority persuasion because one of the things we've learned since Mr. Trump took over the Republican Party is how few there are who are willing to stand up for conservatism as I represent it. The fundamental question for any conservative is what do you want to conserve? And my answer is the American founding. The doctrine of natural rights, limited government, separation of powers, market society, a generally libertarian approach to life. And for the diminished constituency. Well, I was gonna say, I think for many Americans, their, their view would be when you have that degree of a hands-off government, that the problem is the people that have power leverage for more power. And uh, income inequality, as they describe it, gets worse. Um, Corporate power gets increased without government as the break on that expansion. And their argument is that the theoretical um, approach that you describe is not practical for people in the real world, that Americans won't tolerate it. Uh, your, your thoughts on that argument? I'll tell you what's impractical. What's impractical is accepting, expecting the government to intervene as a comprehensive regulator and to be neutral in its regulation. I think that Elizabeth Warren has a firm grip on half of a point. Her firm grip is this. She recognizes 
that five of the 10 most wealthy counties in the United States by per capita income are in the Washington area. Washington has no natural resources. It makes nothing but rules, regulations, and trouble, and yet it is wealthy as can be. Why is that? It's because as trillions of dollars slosh through Washington, interest groups batten onto the ship of state like barnacles on a ship, and they work to bend the government to their private advantage. That is inevitably what will happen. As the government becomes increasingly active in the allocation of wealth and opportunity in our society, it becomes increasingly prey to intense factions that are articulate, educated, wealthy, and well-lawyered. And they know how to bend regulatory government. It is always the case that such government is subject to regulatory capture by various factions. And therefore, the surest protection of an open society is to reduce the government's role in it. Now, I am not saying that, and no conservative of any common sense is saying, that we want to undo the welfare state, that we want to tear, tear up the uh, social safety net. I know a number of lost causes that God knows I've backed enough, and I'm certainly not in, intent on, on dismantling the post-New Deal consensus in our society. What I am in, in bound to do is resist the tendency to expand the government in its regulatory activities that then becomes captured and becomes the plaything of factions engaged in rent seeking, that is bending public power to private advantage. Now, how do you put the genie back in the bottle? And particularly since we're talking about the Republican Party, is there a way for the party to attract more people with a message of, for lack of a better term, governmental austerity? Is, is, there, is there a way of doing that? That's very hard to do because Republicans until 2016 said, we have tremendous problem in this country and that our fundamental entitlement programs, Medicare and Social Security, are on an unsustainable trajectory. So the one thing that the Republicans must do is call the country to arithmetic, to look at these programs and make adjustments, not abolish them, but to make them sustainable. Donald Trump came in, someone explained this unsustainable trajectory to him. And you know what he said? He said, yeah, but I won't be here when the crisis comes. That's the kind of spacious leadership we now have. It is quite clear that the Republican Party today has hitched itself to a falling star. It has hitched itself to Donald Trump, whose view is that he can continue to win by appealing to an ever larger margin of an ever smaller portion of the American electorate. Basically, whites without college education. That is a, it's fewer than a majority in the country, it's a declining majority, yet it's all that Mr. Trump is appealing to. And so an entire generation is rising that doesn't look like this and that the Republican Party does not know how to appeal to. Well, and, and you've got the geographic differences that in your Ford F-150 comment speaks to this issue. If you've traveled the country away from the coasts, even inland in places like California, I'm sure upstate New York and places away from large cities, you see very different um, cultural touch points. Um, you see uh, different degrees of uh, religious faith um, and, and uh, family size, all kinds of demographic difference in the country. But if, if the Republican Party has essentially hitched itself to a white non-college educated cohort, then the, the, how in the world can it possibly sustain and elect candidates to office outside of those parts of the country that fit that demographic? Simple answer. It can't. Remember, Mr. Trump won the presidency because of fewer than 78,000 votes spread over three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But for that unrepeatable fluke, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And therefore, the, I, I do not understand, no Republican I know understands what the president is thinking. Now, maybe the president doesn't think. There's ample evidence for that theory. But he is simply running on automatic pilot. He's going to run 2016 over again. And if he does, and by the way, we're about tonight, 
We're 111 days away from election day. We're 68 days from early voting starting in two states, South Dakota and Minnesota. Time is running short. We're in the seventh inning of this campaign, maybe the bottom of the, bottom of the seventh. So the idea that, that the, the president can now pivot and change his personality, his tactics, and the impression he's made for three and a half years is laughable. So what happens post-Trump? If, if President Trump loses this election or he comes from behind to win it and he's gone four years or less from now, what becomes of, of the party when you've got such heavy buy-in, such huge approval from the current constituency of the Republican Party? This is more Donald Trump's Republican Party than it ever was Ronald Reagan's party. It's hard to believe, but let, let me tell you this. At the 500-day mark of Ronald Reagan's presidency, he had the support of 77% of Republicans. At the 500-day mark of the Trump presidency, he had the support of 87% of Republicans, and today it's in the 90s. Now, that's partly because a number of Republicans, and you're talking to one, who are no longer Republicans. I left the Republican Party more than four years ago. But today, this is purely the Trump Party, not out of conviction. I, there, I don't know any Republican in Congress who would speak well of Donald Trump in private off the record. But they, Republicans live in terror of their constituents. They are terrified of the base in their, in their districts or states. And for that reason, there is this hope that the morning after he loses, and he's going to lose in November, they will wake up and say, Trump, Donald Trump, I don't recognize the name. It's a nightmare that's been dispelled. Let's change the subject. Now, it won't be that easy to do. Should there be a second Trump term, I do not think the Republican Party would survive. Now, that's a strong statement to make for the following reason. We've had amazing stability in our two-party competition. The Democratic Party is the oldest continuous political party in the world. The Republican Party, born in 1854, first candidate in 1856. The Democrats and the Republicans have framed our political competition since 1856. That's an amazing phenomenon, more stable than Britain, for example, much more stable than France. But it is not quite impossible to kill our parties. It's almost impossible. When we used to worry about nuclear war, the scientists said, well, you know, the one thing that will survive are cockroaches because they're such simple mechanisms. Our parties are like cockroaches. They're very simple mechanisms and very hard to kill. It's not impossible. The Whigs disappeared, supplanted by the Republicans. And if the Republicans have two terms of Donald Trump, they will, I think, disappear, supplanted by I know not what. That's what I was going to ask you is, what would it be? Because so-called third parties here in the United States are so weak, get so low a percentage of votes, it's not like there's a party poised to take that, that third position. That's right. But there wasn't a party poised when the, when the Whigs blew apart in the, in the pre-Civil War period over the subject of slavery. The Republican Party was emerged and grew very rapidly. That could happen again. You're quite right. The common axiom about third parties in America is that they're like wasps. They sting and then die. And the reason is obvious. Third parties in the system where you have the winner-take-all allocation of electoral votes don't win electoral votes. Take Ross Perot. 1992, Ross Perot won 20, 19.7% of the popular vote and got zero electoral votes because he didn't carry any states. That does not mean that any party is guaranteed to survive forever. Now, I do not expect the Republican Party to disappear, but I think it will disappear in the unlikely event that Donald Trump is the head of it for eight years. Could it, could it be that you get wealthy individuals who aren't necessarily standard bearers for a party, but who essentially run as their own brand and that our politics morphs from a heavy party system into a, a personality one. That would be the problem. I think that, that that's less of a danger than it was four years ago, because we're now in the midst of a dismal four-year experiment with exactly that. Supplanting parties, supplanting 
the idea of a coherent set of beliefs with personality. I don't think that at the end of this little exercise we're in right now on the, on the politics of a cult of personality, I don't think the American people are going to want to repeat this in the near term. I want to talk about the cultural climate that we're in because the president is um, putting much of his rhetorical effort into uh, culture wars, uh, reviving some that have been historic and attempting to use current events as, as part of that. Um, but we are, in fact, seeing with cancel culture, um, Barry Weiss's resignation from the op-ed pages of the New York Times, uh, the Harper's letter that came out a few days ago that was critical of so-called cancel culture. How, how do cultural differences and, and very um, uh, passionate positions that Americans hold now factor into our political process? They, today, if you watch cable television and listen to talk radio, you'd think they were the political process. That Americans in Fort Wayne and Fort Worth and Duluth and Dallas do nothing but sit around and worry about Confederate statues and who said what at what academic institution. That's not the way the nation is right now, but you're quite right. We are in a moment of maximum intolerance on both ends of the political spectrum. I don't know how many of the people participating here tonight have read Barry Weiss's uh, resignation letter to the New York Times. It's fabulous. It is a brilliant exposition of classic liberalism, tolerance, pluralism, debate, sensibility of, of, of the, the embrace of argument. That is a minority position in many parts of America right now. And we're gonna to have to regain the high ground of Barry Weiss kind of tolerance, uh, or we as a society are in for terrible times. One of the things I hear from journalists, particularly many younger journalists, is that um, it's incumbent on people who have uh, a, a position to communicate to the public that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, that this era that we're in now of social change needs to be um, uh, supported that, I've heard the expression of some journalists, we need to be on the right side of history as uh, the 1950s and 60s civil rights era supporting it was, um, was uh, the moral thing for journalists to do and arguing that those are the positions that news organizations should take today. Uh, what do you think of that argument? I don't think news organizations should take positions of that sort. And I don't think they particularly should decide where history, something with a proper noun, an autonomous force, is something to be on the right side of. The fact that history is heading in some particular direction does not mean we should get on board. We should retain our intelligence, our independence, our scrutiny, and our reason. The phrase getting on the right side of history is an abdication of conscience and intelligence. I don't believe history is a proper noun. I don't think it has a direction. I don't think it is an autonomous force. I think history is made by generations of individuals, each making their own decisions. And the idea that we should rhetorically invoke a bandwagon effect and urge everyone to climb on board is A, bad for citizens, and B, insupportable and ruinous for journalism. So the, the argument that these journalists make is that um, if you don't do this, you end up in a world of false equivalency where the voices of, of people who, who uh, hold to the status quo of, of keeping people in a lesser position in society, uh, you know, give, that you give those voices an equal voice to people uh, who... Um, you know, have been marginalized, and, and that is the marginalized individual who needs now to have his or her voices heard. I understand that argument. I can understand how people feel strongly about that, and I urge all the journalists who feel that way to resign, get out of journalism, go into politics, run for election, elect other people, but don't pretend that you're journalists, because that's not your job. 
Yeah, you're someone who writes quite a bit about uh, uh, colleges. Princeton features quite prominently uh, in your book, The Conservative Sensibility. President Trump, uh, a couple days ago, I think it was, said that um, he would consider uh, seeing if there was a way of defunding colleges and universities that um, pushed a left-wing political agenda. Um, your thoughts on, on what the academy is like these days, and um, has it had a distinct effect on our politics? Politics is downstream from culture. The culture is downstream from academia. And there's no question that academia is intellectually monochrome these days, and that there is a rising intolerance on campus where speech codes and bias reaction teams and all kinds of effects work to produce intellectual conformity. And that's unfortunate. The only thing that could be more unfortunate than what exists is saying that the political class should get involved and try and correct this. It's none of the politicians' business. I think uh, I deeply regret what is happening on campuses. I'm proud that it's less prevalent at good old Nassau at Princeton, where I got my PhD. But the last thing we want to do is to say that it's part of the, the remit of the political class to fine tune the intellectual institutions of this country. To state that is to make it, it seems to me, laughable on the face. But so many people on the right, their argument is if, if there's not some attempt to uh, hold colleges and universities accountable for uh, the monochrome politics, that uh, it's, it's going to lead the country to go in an exclusively progressive direction. And those on the right say that that, that would be ruinous. Well, I believe in the marketplace of ideas. I think my ideas have been losing recently in the marketplace, but I don't think this is inevitable. Again, I don't think history is a proper noun. I don't think history is autonomous. I think we can change the trajectory of things. And I urge my fellow conservatives to get to work and argue, to argue as alumni, to argue as contributors to our colleges, to make your feelings felt there and your power felt there and your persuasion heard there, but do not call in the government to counter left-wing speech codes with right-wing speech codes. That is the route to the ruination of college campuses. In, in the recent protests that we've seen, they have been highly diverse in cities like Los Angeles and elsewhere in the country. In many cases, majority white, uh, heavy Latino representation in those protests. And uh, for many, particularly young Americans, they say this, this is a breakthrough, that people have come together making common cause to uh, hold police accountable for violence against uh, citizens of color, particularly African Americans. And they see this as a real watershed moment in the nation. How do you see this period of protest? Well, I hope it is. I have written, as a card-carrying, certifiable conservative. I've been writing for the last few years against the abuse of plea bargaining, which obviates the right to a jury trial, against solitary confinement, against mandatory minimum sentences, against three strikes laws. I've been writing about criminal justice as much about as any other subject for the last few years. So this is not a simple partisan divide. And I certainly hope there are reforms. There's no question when the Supreme Court recently considered, and in my judgment made the mistake of not accepting, a number of cases about the qualified immunity that in essence licenses police misbehavior, the Supreme Court said it had never seen across the ideological perspective so many briefs on the same side in favor of reform of, of police immunities that results inevitably in abusive police behavior. So this is not, and need not become a partisan issue. I certainly hope that three or four years from now, America in that regard looks very different. But I must tell you in a few months when these furies have burnt out, and the fever has calmed down in the country, 
then the hard work of actual reform begins. What's going on now is kind of fun for a lot of people. It's the striking of poses and the issuing of proclamations and making stances. The hard work of politics, the slow incremental business of persuasion and change requires something more, something more sustained than what we're seeing now. I hope it exists. I'll do my part. I want to ask some uh, questions from members of our audience, uh, because there's some terrific ones that uh, are coming in. George, uh, one of the questions is, is there a hidden Trump vote? People unwilling to tell a pollster what they really think because of how unpopular the president is. I think that was a problem in 2016, but I don't think it is now. I think in 2016, the polls did not catch that fact that there were people. But today, after four years, people who are still in favor of Trump are not reticent. Lord knows they are willing to speak their minds. So I don't think that's, that's a case right now. I tend to trust the polls very much right now, and the polls are astonishingly uh, discouraging for Trump supporters. Uh, another question is, is, is there anything that you could see that would lead Republican Party leadership to separate themselves from the president before Election Day? Yes, in this sense. In 1996, when Bill Clinton was coasting the re-election, running against Bob Dole, by the middle of September 1996, a lot of Republicans running for the Senate and the House began to distance themselves from Bob Dole as a lost cause and said, you need to elect us, we Republicans, to Congress so that we can act as a check upon the president. And I think you will see in the middle of September this year, people saying Republicans for House and Senate saying, vote for us because we will act as a check upon the more progressive impulses of, of Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. That will be the sign that, that the Republicans are jumping ship. What do Republican senators uh, and members of Congress, what do they tell you about the president off the record? <laughs> well, I don't talk to a lot of them off the record because uh, I'm not one of them anymore. But uh, some I've talked to, including some very important ones, they know what they're tied to. They know the man's a disaster. They know that he's poisoning the well for Republicans, not just for 2020, but for 2024 and beyond. They know it's ruinous, and they just hope to survive. Now, I have written, and a lot of my Republican friends, including a number of ex-friends among the Republicans, I have said that I think it's important not only that, that the president be defeated, but that the Republicans lose broadly across the congressional sweep as well, because it has been well said that when there's no penalty for failure, failure will proliferate. And when there's no penalty for the kind of irresponsibility the Republicans have demonstrated in enabling President Trump, then such irresponsibility will proliferate. I think the only way to get their attention is to hit them across the bridge of the nose with a two by four. So they'll say, we really don't want to do this again. Was it in 2012, and you can correct me, I may have my date wrong, the Republican Party did this big research project to try and figure out, you know, how do we become more diverse? How do we attract more Latino voters and uh, more young voters? It'd be a more inclusive party. And then, of course, Donald Trump with his immigration policies, uh, you know, uh, driving away so many Latino Republicans who might have economically felt an affinity for the party didn't feel a home there anymore. So what what makes you think that uh, post-Donald Trump, if the party engages in that sort of soul-searching again, that it, it doesn't sell out that conclusion once more? You, you're quite right. After the 2012 election, after Obama put away Mitt Romney, the Republican Party produced what is known as the autopsy, in which they said all that you said, which is we're, we're missing vast swaths of the American people who are simply not hearing us, or if they're hearing us, they're not liking what they hear. And it made no difference. 
because when you had 18 people on stage at the beginning of the Republican debates in 2015, the most lurid, the most noisy, the most telegenic, the most technicolor and flamboyant man stood out and won. Now, uh, you can only do this so often. History gives you a reprieve. It doesn't give you a reprieve forever. And if the Republican Party continues to lose 90% of the African-American vote this year, I'm sure a, a substantial majority of the Latino vote, an enormous portion of the millennial vote, the Republicans this year will probably lose women's vote by, what, 30 points probably? I mean, how dense do you have to be before facts begin to intrude? How do Republicans rationalize the president's blowing up of the deficit? And I should add to the listener's question, you know, he's not the first Republican to do this. George W. Bush also was a huge spender. Yeah, I, I, I would say to you, you, to the man who posed this question, no one in Washington gives a hoot in hell about the deficit. Because when the chickens come home to roost, as your questioner and I both believe it will, the current political class is exactly what Donald Trump said about the entitlement crisis. I won't be here. They think they'll be gone. Now, the fact is both parties have a powerful and permanent incentive to spend more than they take in in revenues. To give the American people a dollar's worth of government and charge them only 80 cents for it. And to fob off 20%, 25% of the cost of government on the unborn and their unvoting future generations. A permanent incentive in both parties for fiscal irresponsibility. And it will only end when a disaster makes it end. So you think human nature being what it is, there is no way for, uh, for office holders to um, get in front of the train and slow it down. It's, it's, it's just going to obliterate stuff. That's the only thing that's going to stop it. You have to change the incentives. The only way to change the incentives is to have term limits for national legislators, members of Congress and the Senate. I feel so strongly about this. I wrote a book in favor of term limits. It was read by dozens. It changed nothing. Uh, but until you change the incentives, that you cannot have a permanent career in politics, and therefore, there's no point in protecting your career by dodging difficult questions. Until we get term limits, we're not going to have a structure of incentives that will make people fiscally responsible. George, you said you're, you're hoping for a Republican setback this year throughout Congress. What are the odds, uh, one of our attendees asks, of Democrats taking the Senate? If I had to bet my net worth today, I'd be nervous, but I would bet on the Democrats taking control of the Senate. Colorado, North Carolina, Maine, uh, Arizona, there are four seats right there that are, uh, are in, in jeopardy. There are always some surprises we don't see coming. I think the Montana seat held by Danes will be taken by Governor Bullock. That's another, the fifth seat. Assuming Joe Biden wins the presidency and his running mate, whoever that is, uh, can break the tie in the Senate, they only need to gain three. I think they'll gain four or five. So I would expect there to be a Democratic Senate. Uh, speaking of whoever Joe Biden chooses as a running mate, you wrote a very nice piece about our own Karen Bass from here in Southern California, Democratic Congresswoman who heads the Congressional Black Caucus. You think she would be his best choice? Well, I did. I hesitated to write that because I think so highly of her, I didn't want to hurt her chances. And the last thing a Democrat needs is to say some of your wills in favor of you. Uh, one reason I did is that she's a wonderful member of the board of the Institute for, for Democracy. Uh, one of the, probably the best money the federal government spends. A bipartisan group, Scoop Jackson Democrats, Walter Mondale Democrats, Hubert Humphrey Democrats, as well as Republicans, advocating for democracy around the world. She's a very diligent member of that board. She is impeccably progressive. She's not the person I'd pick, but I don't get to pick these things. I have noticed about 70 years ago, I'm 79, 
I noticed about 70 years ago that the universe was not organized entirely for my happiness and satisfaction. I understand that I don't get to pick the Democrats who will be Republicans. But I do want someone with Joe Biden who is intelligent, which he manifestly is, progressive, she chairman of the Democratic, chairwoman of the, of the Black Caucus, interested way before it became fashionable this year in, in reform in the criminal justice system, an accomplished civil woman. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Biden said long ago, he's gonna pick a woman. Events I think have made a, an African-American woman likely. You can't do better than uh, Congresswoman Bass. Uh, we have a, uh, an attendee who'd like to ask a little bit more detail about how specifically was Donald Trump able to take over the Republican Party? What, how, how, how did he make that happen? Well, he, he, there were two steps. First, he won the nomination, and then he, he staggered into the presidency. You were surprised. I was surprised when he won in 2016. He was surprised. His own campaign officials spent the day before the 2016 election briefing us in the media about why they lost. He didn't see this coming. Now, that's stage, stage one. He takes over the Republican Party. After that, he did it with tweets. What was it, 140 characters at that time? Now we're way up to 280 characters. That's all it takes. Republicans who saw Senator Corker of Tennessee get crosswise with Trump and his career end. They saw Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona get crosswise with Trump and his career end. They saw Congressman Mark Sanford of South Carolina get crosswise, his career ends. They live in terror of 280 characters from the president. That is, it, is the presidency with Twitter going to be forever this way, or is, is Donald Trump uh, just going to be an outlier in his use of Twitter to uh, rally his base? I don't know. You know, the first per president to tweet was Barack Obama. And his first tweet said something like, hi, it's me, Barack, how are you? He, he had no idea what he was unleashing on the country. I do hope the next president will have the gift of silence, as someone said George Washington had. I do hope the next president will get out of our face and out of our living rooms. I do hope the next president, you know who I wanted to win the Democratic nomination this year was Senator Bennett from Colorado, who said, if I'm elected president, you'll go weeks without even thinking about me. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have a president who was not obsessively in the American consciousness? I think it's in your book, you, you mentioned, uh, there was a time presidents answered the front door of the White House. <laughs> Does that work? Yes, uh, we're a long way from that era. We sure are. And I, I, as in so many cases, I want to go back. Uh, the Supreme Court has had uh, a number of uh, highly significant decisions uh, just in the past seven days that were announced. Your thoughts about this court majority and what we've seen, particularly from Chief Justice Roberts. Chief Justice Roberts is an institutionalist. He's a conservative man. I know him, gosh, he lives about five blocks from me. But he is first and foremost a custodian of the Supreme Court. He is deeply offended when people talk about Clinton judges and Obama judges and Bush judges and Trump judges. He insists, and I think he's right, that most judges do not think that way. They reason about the law. One of the beauties of the constitutional law system, the beauties of the Supreme Court is they make decisions and they have to say why. They have to lay out their reasons, which is why I write about more about judicial cases than any other subject in my 100 columns a year. So I think what you've seen with Justice Roberts is a conservative man who says, what I want to conserve most is the public confidence in the judicious nature of the judiciary. 
Is it safe to say that unlike many conservatives, you favor judicial activism as the high court being um, a check on the presidency? Is that is that fair to say? I'll put it this way. I wouldn't say judicial activism. I'd say judicial engagement. And judicial engagement in this sense. Can I take w one minute and give you my entire political philosophy? I grew up in central Illinois, Lincoln country, in Champaign County, Illinois. My father was at the University of Illinois, a professor of philosophy. It is said that Abraham Lincoln, a traveling, prosperous railroad lawyer, was in the Champaign County Courthouse in 1854 when he learned that Stephen A. Douglas, the Illinois senator, had passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, which said, we will solve the problem of expansion of slavery into the territories by submitting it to a vote. Douglas said, vote slavery up, vote it down. It's a matter of indifference to me because America is about majority rule. Lincoln's recoil from that, his ascent to greatness, was in his rejection of that formulation. He said, America is devoted majority rule, but it is not about majority rule. It is about liberty. It is about equality. And therefore, there are some things we put beyond the reach of majorities. There are some things we do not put to a vote because we are a country not about a process, majority rule, but about a condition, liberty. And therefore, it is up to the courts to stand against majoritarian institutions when they threaten liberty. To that extent, I, like Lincoln, am in favor of an engaged judiciary that is a, not a majoritarian institution. Well, let's ask, what are your thoughts about the Lincoln Project and related efforts? <laughs> I love it. I think the ads they're running, uh, they make me feel good. I don't know if they're having any, any effect on the electorate, but it's cathartic for me. Uh, what will foreign policy in the Republican Party look like post-Trump? I think uh, China is going to bring us all together. I think China in the South China Sea. I think China running concentration camps. That's not mince words. Concentration camps with more than a million Uyghurs at the kind of cultural genocide, forced abortions, forced birth control, sterilization, all being practiced against the Uyghurs. 1945, we said never again after concentration camps. They're back. And I think the Republicans and the Democrats are going to find common ground in opposing this grotesque behavior by the Chinese and Chinese aggression that extends from the border with India to the South China Sea. And the test is going to be, and it's going to come, I think, very early to President Biden, what to do in defense of the vibrant democracy of 26 million people on Taiwan. George Will, um, before we wrap, I did want to talk briefly baseball because you and I are huge fans. You're far more uh, expert in your analysis than me. But uh, we're going to have 60 regular season games uh, commencing uh, the 23rd of this month, going into uh, what's supposed to be a typical uh, playoff uh, leading to the World Series. What are you anticipating, particularly the experience watching games without fans in the stands? It's going to be awful, but what can we do? I mean, that baseball is better than no baseball at all. What it means, a 60-game schedule, is that each game is the equivalent of 2.7 games in a 162-game schedule. So it's a, it's a sprint automatically. The beauty of baseball is the long season. Every team goes to spring training knows, knowing it's going to lose 60 games, knowing it's going to win 60 games. You play the whole season to sort out the middle 42. Well, this year it's a sprint, not a marathon. It's going to be hard to get used to. Think about this. What if someone bats 400 this year? What if the Cleveland wretched Indians, who have not won the World Series since 1948, at last win the World Series this year? Are they going to be happy? I don't think so. That would be too bad because even though it's a short season, it is an official season. It will be an accomplishment. I understand that anything that gets, speaking of the glories of Southern California, anything that gets Mike Trout back on the field is all right with me. 
Uh, indeed, a absolutely. In closing, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, uh, to go back to our theme tonight. If you could wave a magic wand and transform the Republican Party or, or bring a new party to its place that you think would have the opportunity to appeal to sufficient numbers of Americans and would uh, support the kind of America you think would be healthiest, what would those changes be? Those changes would be, well, first I'd say everyone should pick up the conservative sensibility. It's all in there. Uh, but without self, such self-serving advertising, I'd say this. The American founders got it right. That democracy is good, but democracy is problematic. That majority should rule, but not everywhere and always. That care needs to be taken, that majorities are temperate and reasonable and checks and balances keep them so. That the American people are an inherently cheerful lot. We're not naturally angry. This fever will burn out. And someone will stand up, as Adlai Stevenson said, when he was the liberal leader of the Democratic Party and their nominee in 52 and 56, he said, let's talk sense to the American people. Let's tell them there are no gains without pains. The American people can take that kind of common sense. And I think we're going to see equilibrium restored because people are going to insist upon it. They are going to grow weary of the posturing and the shouting and the nonsense and say, everybody, deep breath, calm down. Let's get forward. Uh you know, we're in this era of COVID-19 and the pandemic. I think you know, many people are deeply concerned, especially since um, uh, attitudes and, and, and people's temperaments are frayed as it is. If we go deep into next year and we still don't have a highly effective vaccine, if we have not come close to a herd immunity of the population, um, what are your concerns, if any, about the effect that that has on the stability of the country or politics? The question is a good one because we don't know. We are not creatures hardwired for solitude. We are creatures who are naturally sociable. That's what Aristotle meant when he said we're political animals. You take 326 million people and separate them, lock them down, keep them from commerce and normal social intercourse. For that long, we have no idea. That's, that's terra incognita, and I do not want to explore it. So let's just hope we don't get there. And let's close on the hopeful note that we don't. We do have some progress on uh, at least a couple of vaccine fronts, and treatments are becoming much more effective for those who become ill. So we'll end with that positive note. George Will, thank you. It is such a pleasure to talk with you. I really appreciate your being with all of us tonight. Thank Great. you. Thanks for letting me be with you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you that attended this special program. You're in good company of, of more than 2,000 people here uh, watching this very special event put on by Community Advocates, Inc. and by the organization Judge. Uh, we also want to remind you, Bill Crystal uh, with Pat Morrison, that's coming up next week, next Wednesday at this same time. And there's going to be a brief questionnaire on the screen after this program. We ask you to pre please complete it, and that gives us very important feedback to make sure that we're, we're serving your interests and your needs. Uh, again, I'm Larry Mantle. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special uh, evening. We'll look forward to talking with you again.